Good morning. Good morning. We're on the final wave here. Thank you. It's so gratifying to see so many of you here at 8.30. I think 8.30 is more civil than 8 o'clock. So uh, well done, as it's a, uh, in, in, in the UK. Uh, our speaker this morning is uh, Natalia uh, Sokolova. She's a managing partner of SDG World, which is a single uh, family office that was started by her uh, father uh, based in uh, Switzerland. And she's gonna be talking about uh, Game On, how family offices are modifying their investment strategies to pick a winner. So, uh. oh, thank, thank, thank you for a kind introduction and uh, thank you for getting up early and to be here, appreciate that. Uh, so I just want to start with probably a couple of basic statistics about family offices. There are about 10,000 family offices in the world and uh, a bit more of our $5 trillion that are managed by high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals. Uh, hubs would be places like London, Hong Kong, Switzerland, uh, Dubai. Um, and um, so what's different, really the difference is U.S. and China are focusing more on a growth strategy rather than emerging markets in Europe are more balanced, which means they're focusing on preservations and growth. Um, I found an interesting statistic that in 2017, China had uh, two new billionaires every single week. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> and uh, what's also different because a lot of investment in China are done in tech, so when people take their money, they exit, they put it in a new venture. So basically, the number of the family office has increased from about 50 to almost 1,000 in less than two years. Um, as far as the statistic for report that was produced in 2008 for the Global Family Office Report, uh, the average uh, family office portfolio returned about 15.5%, which was about 7% up from the year before. Um, about two-fifths of all the family offices, they're engaged in sustainable investments, and alternative usually consists an average of the half, half percent of the overall portfolio. 28% goes to equities, 22% goes to the private equity, and uh, direct investments account to about 39% of the total portfolio. In 2017, private equity uh, created about 18% return on investment. So why do family offices switch more to direct deals and to the private investments? Well, um, well there are a few reasons for it. Number one is uh, that the shift is starting to go from uh, second generation, let's call it first generations, uh, let's call it G1, <coughs> to second generation uh, G2. So uh, when the <coughs> first generation was created, created their family offices, by definition, they wanted to preserve their wealth. So when they pass it on to their heirs, they, uh, you know, usually several brothers and sisters. So the wealth has been divided by, you know, by, by several individuals. So the amount of that they can invest is less than patriarchs can. So rather than focusing on preservation, they start focusing on growth and picking up more liquid, uh, direct, alternative investment that then can produce high yields. Uh, I mean, like real estate still consists about 16, 17% of average family office investments. Um, another reason is that uh, single family offices are not really constrained uh, as other funds by the time frame. And also, by definition, they had a very successful exit, so they have a very good knowledge in a specific industry. So when they write a check to a company in that industry or a fund focused in that industry, uh, they can not only provide a check, but also expertise that's considered value available by the people who are, are running that fund or a company. So with the switching of, uh, to the higher returns, higher allocation to alternatives, what we can see is that a lot of family offices are outsourcing a lot of their back operations to companies that just focus on the back operations. And if you consider that about 70% of family offices will uh, transfer their wealth to the second generation in 10 to 15 years, you understand that this trend will continue uh, increasing. And uh, so like what uh, some companies do, large accounting firms have added uh, back, family back office to their practice. Um, like we like working with Eisen Amper, uh, they're a great uh, accounting firm, 
but they also, you know, added a back office operation to help with the diligence, help with uh, not only estate financial planning, cross border operations. So we, we'll, um, and also of course it's cost saving because you don't need to bring everything in house, and you can stay on top of the technology trends uh, providing this. So another trend that we can see shifting from uh, first generation to second generation is uh, more awareness. So by more awareness, I mean more investment uh, focused towards impact. So last year there was about uh, around $230 billion spent on impact investing. So what is really an impact investing? So as defined by GINN, Global uh, Impact Investor Network, it's investment made with the intention to create positive, measurable, social, environmental impact along the financial return. So, um, Traditionally, you know, most of the companies look at the measure of, uh, of KPIs as you know, profit, turnover, volume. But right now, uh, it's starting also to add such KPIs as agility and purpose. And it's kind of hard, uh, sad to see that only one third of the family offices actually have a defined purpose uh, in, in their operations. So I think the newer, the second generation coming from millennials, who are much more aware and about the purpose and about what's going on in the future, uh, they're shifting uh, their KPIs more towards agility and the purpose. And you know, how do you create a purpose? So the purpose is basically why. You know, you start with why. Why we're here. Why that family office has been created. Uh, what is the most important reason for being here? And the one I kind of like is, what will happen if we just dissolve, if the family office is to exist? Would it have a negative impact? So when you honestly ask yourself those questions, it can really help you to create really purpose and see which direction you're going. And uh, it's uh, actually proven that any company who uh, implement that in their system of practice, they do not only do it better for the world, but also their uh, revenues go up about two to four percent and they are able to attract much more uh, eager new teams and uh, talented people to their team as well. So I wanted to actually to take, a, uh, take a side from the family office and see how did I get here and what would actually happen for me to be standing here. So uh, coming from a family office that was, well, my father Michael was around 19, uh, early 90s. Uh, they won a tender by the Russian government right after the fall of the Soviet Union. So uh, there was an oil and gas field. So a number of years has passed. They worked on a many of a serious government project. My father now resides in Switzerland. He is identical to it in Germany. But there's still the main basis of operations is uh, oil and gas right now, last few years natural gas with uh, government project, government supported funding outside the family and then bring other families from Europe, Middle East as well. So the, uh, uh, the idea was for me to come and study, graduate from university here, and then go to live either Switzerland or Moscow and run with my dad. At that time, I was the only child to the family, so there was a lot of expectation were placed on you know, my well-being and being able to take over the family in the future. But when I got into university, I just, just, just turned 17. Uh, back a week after my 17th birthday, I got in a really bad car accident. And uh, doctors gave me three days to live. And the best case scenario was the wheelchair. So as you can imagine, being a teenager in a, uh, in a different country, it's kind of definitely uh, changed the way my world operated, the way I was thinking. So forget everything, all the agendas that were in my mind before. The only agenda was, I had was actually to survive and to live a normal life, to start walking. And um, so about three years later when I realized that actually I was able to fight that accident and I can walk, I can have a normal life. I graduated from college, but now my whole purpose of my life has changed because I didn't want to go back and you know just kind of be a not probably not the right word, but work with my dad and just follow everything that they were doing. Uh, I wanted to, I knew that there was a reason why I was kind of left alive, and I was figuring out that what's my purpose. So I worked and I studied really hard. I, I know, built several companies because in order to make an impact, you actually have to, you know, 
learn how to do a lot of things by yourself and to create your own wealth, and knowledge is the power, of course. So rather than going back, I stayed in this wonderful country, and you know, many years later, uh, and actually 16 years ago, I founded SGG to uh, uh, stands for uh, that particular division of SGG is uh, uh, strategic global growth. Is to utilize the relationship the family office has, my personal experience, and to really use that brand of the company to focus on impact investing, primarily social impact. Uh, so, uh, about two years ago, when we were trying to redefine the purpose with everything that was going on in the world, I kind of looked at it and said, okay, what have we learned in SGG? And um, uh, business has a much greater stability if they have a greater purpose. Agility is essential for any business to survive in our ever-changing environment. Um, staying ahead of the trends and ahead of everybody of their competition is definitely creates a competitive advantage. And uh, our purpose is a social impact. So the companies we choose to work with do have specific purpose, global footprint, a possibility of a global footprint, um, exponential, potential exponential, and you know, great team of course, and a good probability of success. And then my survival has taught me that everything is mind over matter. So the most people that the most reason people don't recover is, you know, they have a mental blocks. It's like, oh my God, this has happened, and my life is over, and I cannot go past that moment. And we see these blocks not only in our lives and the business as well. When you hit something, hit the wall, and it takes something to get over it. So, and I realized there that through my personal experience, there's a lot of ways to get past that block. And not only I was able to help it to myself. But um, I know of three people that I was able to help through my modeling career to get out of the wheelchairs and to give them motivation to continue going to get out of the wheelchairs. So I knew that worked, I knew it existed. So I started doing more research on it and um, realized that the biggest, large, the single largest activity that can impact behavioral change is gaming. Because uh, you know it's starting to becoming more popular th uh, these days, but uh, still there's a lot of misconception what really gaming is. People think of the gaming and somebody sitting mindlessly in front of the screen and you know playing like some kind of game. But realistically, when I hear the word gaming, I hear about the world gamification, and it's using the gaming features that can be applied to anything that's not game related. Uh, basically, it's incentive-based behavior that can change the way that people think and operate. So using that, I mean, it was really, really interesting. You know, because simply, behind, simply defined, gamification is the name of the game, using the game and uh, to drive user engagement, loyalty, and motivate them to have the outcome that you desire. So it's kind of powerful. Uh, so the gamification right now uses the a huge impact on industries, you know, such as the healthcare, education, finance, wellness, corporate governance. Uh, if you have little kids, I'm sure all, you all have heard of Khan Academy because it's a way, a great way for kids to learn when they refuse to learn, but they still want to play, uh, learn through gaming. A lot of universities are just in and accepting different ways to e-learning. You know, if you're learning second language, Duolingo, it's all about gaming. This is just an education, there's endless amount of examples. But also what's, I think, um, on corporate side, uh, Walmart. You cannot, if you want to be a manager in Walmart, uh, it's not enough for you just to go through the interviews. They created a game that a manager, a person who wants to become a manager, they have to learn every single aisle from dry goods to diapers to whatever, to customer satisfaction, how to deal with the stress. Everything in down is the gaming environment. He has to pass all the levels. And once he passes the game or she passes the game, then they're allowed to go into like next level, like next stage of interviews. So more and more companies are incorporating gaming or gamification. Uh, the example which kind of touched me the most is, um, um, so what's the name of the game? So it's, it's called Folded. Uh, Folded, there was for 15 years, uh, people who were fighting uh, HIV and AIDS 
Uh, they couldn't find a way to cipher some kind of protein. I'm not a doctor and I would be able to explain it correctly. But the point is, it's, uh, they created a game uh, at the University Center of Game Science that brought about 200,000 gamers to compete each other. And within 10 days, they were filed to put the puzzle together to decipher that particular protein, something that scientists could not do in 15 years. So just that alone, you can understand how much you know, power is in the game. So having uh, this kind of knowledge, it's like, okay, what, what can we do knowing that, uh, uh, that the best way to impact the world is by changing the people's behavior, especially with what's going on in right now with the greenhouse gases. Um, the prediction were that if we don't cut down the greenhouse gases, I mean, the world is going to come to a net sooner or later, and 2017 was the year over the highest number, unfortunately. So ice is melting, uh, global warming is coming, and uh, the way to really fight it is to unite all the people, not just you know, top companies, but really people around the world, you know, to go plant the tree, or to do something, or to use, you know, less, uh, you know, drive less, whatever the little things, because little thing matters. And the way to do it is really through gamification, uh, like uh, to, for the companies to give incentive to people. If you plant a tree, you get a token that you can use to buy something. I mean, this is very specific, very, very simple example, but you can imagine that uh, how uh, huge the potential can be. So we decided, okay, to figure out the way how to use the world, how to use all that knowledge and, and to impact the world. So we, uh, so basically, let me introduce the company who is called WAM, and WAM is the network that basically points to be the MTV for gaming. So it covers all the traditional gaming and esports, but also is the only one that covers all the lifestyle and culture of gaming around the world. And the purpose is to use it to attract 2.6 billion gamers who play every single day around the world and they're very engaged in their community to use that uh, gaming audience to attract people, to inspire them, uh, to uh, uh, figure out how to get them engaged into really making the world a better place through different gaming and uh, through different gamification activities. Um, for instance, there is a such company that's called Games for Change. They use um, TED Talk videos, they have about a thousand hours of TED Talks, that focus on how gaming can, um, you know, help with the autism and different learning behaviors. So, um, and so they're they're partnering with them as well. So that's kind of which everything I put together. I mean, I'm still working in a lot of other projects, of course, with my family business. But it's for me something very personal to me. It really became the where I can do the most impact through putting together people, putting together families. Is really through a highway that allows to uh, uh, t that allows to reach so many people in the world. So that was really something interesting for me. Um, and uh, so going back to, um, I, actually wanna, I, I do want to mention a couple more examples of how the gamification, because I'm just fascinated with that. Uh, there is um, uh, kids who go through cancer, they suffer a, a, a enormous amount of pain. And for doctors to be able to uh, find different cures, they really have to, uh, you know, know the journal, the, all the imports. And but the kids don't want to write stuff in the journals. Um, and so they created a game that's uh, called a pain squad. And by using this game, the kids not only uh, write the information into their journal, uh, and uh, but they also became very excited that they are making difference in the world and then making the difference in how to uh, uh, fight the, um, the cancer around the worldwide. So I have like a uh, um, question in the audience. How many of you have a kids who are about teenagers, like from 12 to that? And uh, do, you, uh, do you see them spending a lot of time on the, com on the computer, on the games? 
And is it become something a problem for you, the fighting? That's one of the things. I have a 13 year old, and uh, about three years ago, I started fighting with him. Okay, you can't spend the time in front of the computer or in front of the thing. Get out, you know, go play hoops, go do that. You know, if it is like, why are you sitting inside? Go be with your friends. And uh, that's one of the things that I realized that he's, he started listening to me less, and he was very engaged in the gaming, and they learn other stuff and they start playing within the groups in the gaming. So it's becoming such a different environment uh, that also made me a way to realize that this is the way we think and the way they think is so different that it's hard for, I mean, it's hard for me to understand the way he thinks and it's only one generation apart. So if we're not gonna change the way we think in our mythology and life and the culture, in the business we're creating to take to look 10 steps ahead in our business plans and completely get out of the norm because the world is revolving so fast that you just don't, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. And that's why I think agility is such an important factor to, for any business to implement. Um, and um, uh, another thing that with the new generations, you know, everybody's talking about millenniums, now they're talking about uh, teenagers, which is Generation Z. So millennials were focused really on uh, electronics, technology, and a lot of social impact. And Generation Z is changing, and we really don't know exactly what they're going to come into, but you know it's going to be different. Um, my 13-year-old uh, and my, my little one, they're totally different. So I think that by adjusting our mentalities and adjusting our business structure, it's very interesting to, uh, it's very important for us to stay at, at top. So I, um, what is to, to uh, how many of you are family offices here or people who are invest in the, in the companies? And when, uh, when you have, uh, when, you, when you look, do you, how many of you actually have the impact strategy behind your operation? All right, so quite a few, that's awesome. And uh, how many people are doing a cross-border transactions? So it's ma mainly a United States, many of you that I say. Hey, uh, how many of you are looking to do more cross-border transactions or you think it's gonna be uh, more, with everything going on in the world, it's gonna be more uh, localized or it's important to do uh, businesses outside of U.S. Uh, so, and for, for those, uh, so a kind of a, uh, a curious question, do you, do you, have you, uh, have you came across gamification in your life and uh, without realizing how important it is to the future and how strong the potential it can, can have to create a really big impact on not only social but environment life as well? Did that ever occur to you? Let's see, that's awesome. So for me, that was my main message, is to give some thoughts to implement something in your work, in your strategies, in your uh, purpose, that maybe something you didn't think about, and to look into gamification more uh, from totally different perspective than watching your uh, kids play the game. So uh, that is actually what I wanted to say, so thanks so much for playing with me here, and I would love to actually answer any questions that you might have. Um, I was supposed to talk about blockchain, but um, I know I'm going to cut it short, so also if you have any questions on, or if you want any case studies, you know, my information is here, so you can always reach me with any um, with any information or any materials that you like to provide. And uh, do you have any questions for me? Any questions for Talia? Huh? Uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk about gaming as a force for good. You said there are 2.6 billion people who, 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 who game, and therefore there is a lot of power there in terms of communication and, and change. I think for most of us who have kids, uh, you know, gaming, even though it's entertaining, often has a negative connotation because the kids are spending so much time on the games or social media. How many would agree with that? Okay, look, all the hands are going up here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you're trying to make a very persuasive argument for doing something different. Um, how, give me some further examples of, because it is a borderless world, mm -hmm. and you know, all you really need is a mobile phone, 
Exactly. And, and that's low access in terms of cost across the developing world. Mm -hmm. Give me some examples of how people, be it the Gates Foundations or others, mm -hmm. could use gaming mm -hmm. to spread this idea of wellness, inoculation, anything like that. Yeah? Well, if you take Africa, I mean, there are a lot more mobile phones than toilets in the people, so right. they have access to the phones. Um, and um, like Vietnam right now, they're having a huge, like their production of, because of climate change, uh, the production of rice is being de is decreasing, and uh, they need people to you know more more farmers, more even like technologies uh, to uh, to assist them. So in all the places you can easily, uh, I think there's actually a game created that for um, each uh, like the the people for producing extra rice they get a little token. Uh, or talk it as well as an incentive, you know, that's what I was going to go to the blockchain conversation, but it's just too long of a topic right now. Uh, and uh, anybody who has a phone, they, they have a community. Um, and the community, you know, with 2.6 billion gamers or, you know, their uh, social media profile, because um, they're using, actually in third world countries, the, the phone are being used even more than here because that's their uh, connection to the world. So if the companies and the, uh, work on using those uh, gamer aspects and to connecting to the people in all the parts of different of the world by providing some kind of incentive based behavior uh, to do the positive change to you know go plant a tree and for that money you can get actual access to something a token or incentive that you can actually go and use and buy or download to the phone that can really help in a tremendous world to uh, help us with the environment in our world but if you see uh uh, if we see Natalia's presentation in its totality, you, know, you start talking about the breakdown of family offices, where they're making their investments, mm -hmm. but you also talked about only a third of family offices having a purpose, if I yeah. call that correctly. You talked about this sort of, uh, this idea of agility and purpose, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and for the younger generation, getting them involved, of course, is always a big question for family offices. What you're suggesting maybe is one way to get them involved. If there are, you have kids who are into gaming, maybe have impact investing through them, perhaps developing some sort of app that can be used. Absolutely. Okay. And also, like what I what I personally didn't realize, and my my son playing Fortnite a lot, so they're playing with a squad. And uh, well, figured everybody does, right? <laughs> uh, so. How many of you know Fortnite? I don't. <laughs> okay, a lot of hands going up here. So there are a lot of people. We've heard of it. <laughs> and now it's you know going to Apex Legend, but he still prefers Fortnite. Um, and what is actually interesting because uh, they because they're playing in the squads and it's uh, you know with the esport they all want to some of them want to get in the professional gaming into esports. So it's all about not how good you are, but how good you play within a team. And uh, when you and that really helps the kids, which. A lot of schools and universities don't teach you is really how to work very closely in a very fast-paced team environment uh, when you're not only protecting, you know, you got everybody's back, you're throwing them the life jackets or whatever the potions they have in the games. I'm not a gamer. Um, and I'm not, a, I mean, I'm a game with other stuff, but I'm not a Fortnite gamer. <laughs> um, and uh, so what, for example, you know, like we had a meeting and there was one person from uh, eSports team, you know, a little kid. and. Uh, um, uh, Gary, Gary Clement, who's uh, my partner in the uh, in the uh, in the e-gaming sport, uh, you know, he basically reached out to pay for the dinner, and the kid, you know, was like, no, no, I have to contribute. And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, we are brought up in the gaming environment that unless you contribute to the team, you cannot be a part of the team. So, you know, thank you for inviting me, but I really want to contribute to that dinner. It just changes you how much the gaming is changing mentality of the kids to a much greater thing. Um, and so, I mean, when I started looking why my son is playing, I mean, I, I was not happy for a few years and that caused a lot of uh, fights and disagreements and now I'm basically saying, mom, you owe me excuses for all those years, you have to say sorry for not letting me do it. But of course everything is good in moderation, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but um, I just think that, I mean, another example, one of my friends just graduated from high school and he's like, what do you want from your high school? Never, never was into history. And it's like, I want to go to Italy. I was like, really? And that's what you want? I was like, yeah, because the game I played, a lot of places and the things happened on the historical Italy. I want to go and travel to all the historical destination and really see it for myself what I saw in the game. 
So like as being as parents, we really don't see those things, but actually for the kids playing a sports, it's really preparing them to live the environment where it's a lot of teamwork, uh, very, uh, teaches them agility, very fast-paced environment. So that's actually, there's a lot of positive in the gaming and that's why I wanted to talk about it. Uh, I think a great thing always is kind of think outside the box because solutions can come from anywhere. Uh, so let's just stay on this for a moment because we have a, a few minutes here. If you have a family office, if you have family gatherings, and you're trying to engage, you know, Gen 2 or Gen 3 or Gen 4, wherever you are in your families, how would you use a simple gaming exercise to try and bring families together? And do you think, in like, how many of you think gaming could help communication in families? Raise your hands and bring it together as, a, as an activity. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, traditional gaming. Well, huh? Traditional gaming. Yeah, any gaming, yeah. Or, or, Traditional, or, or, I think you're talking about electronic gaming well, here. Uh, both. You're Absolutely talking about both, okay. yeah. How many of you have tried that? How many of you think it might be a good idea to try it at another meeting? Okay, so you know, you're, you're generating some ideas here. Mm -hmm. Let, let's just throw this out here a second in terms. You're having a family meeting. Would you just give everybody some monitors maybe and then play a simple game that might lead to better communication? How would, how would you do that? Well, I mean, it depends what's your purpose. So basically, you find what your goal is. And let's say from this particular, you have, let's say you, you, you have a board meeting, and you have two or three generation, and you want to get them involved into your business or understand them, what is that your corporation or family office uh, is doing. And uh, in order to do it, it's, it's, you can create it through the gaming and uh, have them figuring out a strategy, uh, how to ex explaining strategy like your, uh, when you, when you do a deal, there's a lot of steps, and having some kind of a game that'll figure it out, you know, what, what steps you need to take in order to get from point A to point B. I mean, that would be, of course, not something in a small family environment because you're not gonna create a game for it, uh, but I mean, it's, uh, the, the, that can be definitely used on a much larger scale with big corporations to get new talent and to get new audience and engagement to engage uh, to, um, uh, with the customers, with the suppliers. But as far as the, in the family goes, I think just, uh, I think a lot of problem is uh, mis, um, misunderstanding between the generations. And uh, the younger generation, they don't think that we understand them at all, especially, you know, like I went through that. It's like, mom, you don't get it. And it's like, so by, I think, utilizing what they enjoy, what they understand in our own environment. And it's like, okay, maybe they actually do get it. Maybe I should pay attention to what my mom or dad is saying. You know, well, that's kind of inter interesting. So I think that's the um, easiest and the simple way to connect with the younger generation right now. Okay. Any other uh, observations or questions? Or, no. yeah. Let's have a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So now you have a, uh, a network coffee break until 9.30. <laughs>